teased uh, or anything else I think I caught in the chat. Um, let's move on to our main presentation for today. So our featured speaker is Leo Tuckman, an ISA certified arborist and ASCA registered consulting arborist with a background in tree care consulting and commercial tree care. Leo started his career in arboriculture at the University of California, Davis, where he attained a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Horticulture and Urban Forestry. After school, he began his career in commercial urban forestry, uh, providing tree management services, including pruning, removal, and plant health care recommendations, multi-year management plans, uh, ed and educational talks for clients. His scope of tree care consulting work includes level one through three tree risk assessment, tree appraisal, tree protection plans during construction, plant health care management plans, and tree inventories. Leo currently provides these services and others as the plant health care arborist for West Coast Arborist San Francisco Bay Area offices. And Leo is also in ISA tree risk assessment qualified and holds a qualified applicator's license with the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. So today we will get to hear about uh, common local tree disease from Leo and pests afflicting the Bay Area's urban forests. And we'll hear about integrated treatment me methods such as uh, trunk injection, systemic trunk spray, and soil drenched and injection, as well as host pest interactions and pest management monitoring topics. Thanks, Leo. I'm gonna pass it over to you. Yeah, sounds good. So. This, this one right here? Yes, turn that mic on. Right, and then. Good. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. I may live in the East Bay, but I love coming into San Francisco, so I appreciate all the work you do for the city. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Shoba, for that introduction. Uh, yes, as Shoba said, my name is Leo Tuckman. I'm the plant healthcare arborist for West Coast Arborist, registered consulting arborist, now board certified master arborist, just passed my test. Um, and I will be talking to you today about pests in the Bay Area, San Francisco specifically. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, pests that are currently here, as well as some that are just showing up, some that we're worried about showing up. Uh, we're going to talk about treatment methods, um, how to identify pests, and uh, towards the end of our presentation, depending on how much time we have, we're going to talk about more macro management using uh, tree inventories, the benefits of large scale tree inventories, both in general urban forestry management, but more specifically in plant healthcare management and keeping track of pests in our cities. Um, with that being said, let's get started. So. What are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to be doing an overview of insects and disease, about 10 or 11 of them that are common throughout uh, either the Bay Area, California as a whole that are creeping up here or other parts of the country that are making their way out here. We're going to talk about how to identify pest problems, so what to look for in the field to identify a pest or disease. Um, we're going to talk about treatments to control pests. That includes things like soil injection, trunk sprays, trunk injection, as well as cultural methods. Um, we're going to talk about the host pest environmental interactions and the importance of monitoring as a foundation for an integrated pest management uh, program. So landscape pests, uh, what we're talking about generally when we talk about pests is living organisms that are considered a detriment to the plants and the environment we care about. That can include vertebrates such as gophers, rabbit, deer, as well as birds in some cases, insects and arthropods, mites, ticks, spiders, all of that, um, various mollusks, snails, slugs, nematodes, uh, a whole host of microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, uh, viruses, oh, there's my nematodes and microorganisms, uh, and of course, plants that are uh, invasive species and problems. So we're talking about weeds, vines, parasitic plants like mistletoe. Um, so the controls for these various pests range. Uh, when we're talking about chemical controls, we have things like insecticides for insects, herbicides for plants, uh, and of course, fungicides for the various fungus that can impact our trees in the urban forest. Uh, and the controls that we're using depend uh, on the pests. It's specific. So when it comes to applying a treatment to a pest like this, 
when you're using a product like this, it's important to consult a PCA and get the appropriate recommendations so that we're applying uh, the, the right products, we're applying it in the right quantity, and we're applying it in the right way so that it's both effective and is uh, not harming the surrounding environment. Um, that being said, for our purposes, purposes today, we're not talking about vertebrates. We're not talking about weeds. We're going to be talking about insects and we're going to be talking about diseases uh, that we are concerned about that are either already here uh, or are showing up, which I'll talk about soon or are on the way. So the first one I'm going to talk about is one that's getting a lot of chatter right now in the Bay Area among the tree people. It is uh, invasive shot hole borer. So invasive shot hole borer uh, is uh, an insect, an embryotia beetle that has been around in Southern California for over 10 years, uh, causing problems down there. It affects a large host of species, uh, but can be very damaging, particularly to platinus. So London plane trees, California sycamores, um, where they will, you know, infest these trees with thousands of holes. The holes of these insects are no bigger than uh, uh, the head of a uh, ballpoint pin. So they're very small insects, very small holes. Um, but these are um, insects that will enter the trees. They will uh, burrow into, our, into the wood and uh, they are the vector for Fusarium which is a fungus. They're kind of like little farmers, so they have a wide host of trees, but they are really only feeding on the fungus. So they inject the fungus into the trees, the fungus grows in the tree, and they eat the fungus. Um, this insect, as I said, has been in Southern California for over a decade. Uh, in the fall of last year, it was identified in San Jose. So it is confirmed now to be in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of talk between uh, private arborists, uh, municipal entities, uh, government agencies on uh, how we are going to be managing this, monitoring this, and keeping track of this insect, uh, because this one has done a number on the trees in Southern California. It has taken out entire willow groves and riparian areas along the Tijuana River. Uh, this tree can have a huge, this insect can have a huge impact, uh, especially in urban forests where you think of, you know, one street can be lined with only platinous London Plain. These insects can quickly take over all of those trees and have an impact. Um, when it comes to this insect, there are treatments for it, but it depends on the infestation level. So when it comes to determining, can we treat this insect? We look at how many hits, how many holes we're finding on the tree. Um, generally above 100 hits, 100 holes. Uh, the tree, it's going to be very difficult to treat and, and recover from. I have seen trees, though, very recently in San Jose that have less than 50. Uh, and these are trees that are prime for treatment. So there are ways to treat for this insect. Um, there are trunk sprays to prevent further insects from getting into the tree and uh, soil injections that the trees can then take up through their root system. We'll talk about trunk, inje or trunk injection, trunk sprays and soil injection later in the presentation that the trees can then take up and uh, provide resistance for this beetle. Um, now, as it relates to San Francisco specifically, that's that's where we are today, um, it can make its way here, but from the people I've talked to and, and my opinion, San Francisco is um, better equipped to not be infested by this beetle because uh, this insect really likes warm climates. That's why it did so well in Southern California. That's why it took a while to get up here. And that's why where it took a hold, where we identified it, it was in San Jose. So um, to my knowledge, it has not been identified in the city yet. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't show up here. Um, but uh, yes, it, the, the climate of San Francisco provides resistance. Do you want to do questions now? We can do it. Yeah, yeah. You had a quick question? Yeah, yeah no problem. I'm just curious about when you say warmer climates, because like certain microclimates within San Francisco might be more favorable. Absolutely. And just... Is there is there a temperature range that we know of yet, or is it still pretty low? Like yeah, you know, I need to get back to you on the specific temperature range of that. Um, I know that we're we're more concerned right now about the 680 corridor, so Pleasanton, Danville, San Ramon, which you generally think of as having you know much hotter summers, um, as being of concern. Uh, I know. The, from the people I've talked to, they're not as concerned about the coastal regions because it gets cooler. Though in every talk I've been to so far, I'm pretty sure they just said cooler. Yeah. So I need to get back to you on specific. Yeah, sure. I'm sure there is a specific temperature range. And 
I, absolutely, and, and uh, I can follow up with you to to provide that specifically for San Francisco, so you can keep an eye out for microclimates within the city that are more susceptible to this insect, um, because we want to make sure if it is showing if it is showing up here, um, we are able to contain it. Yeah, quick question. Turn your mic on. Yes, they reproduce at above sixty five degrees. Thank you. So I think like all of our eastern neighborhoods, uh, we have to kind of keep an eye on. Um, and I, I was just at the, the San Jose coordination meeting. Oh, you were there and, as well. Yeah, so it sounds like our box elders are like a, the key priority now. Like with that, at first they were only identified in um, our London Plains, uh, our London Plains in San Jose, but now box elders seem to be a bigger worry there. Um, all of Guadalupe Creek seems pretty bad. Um, that's That was the biggest update. I think now they're moving on to how they might deal with the stumps in areas that they can't pull the stumps or grind the stumps. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, and as you alluded to, this insect can infest stumps as well. Uh, it generally hits the trunk of trees and lower scaffold limbs. It wants the wood, which is where uh, it's injecting the fusarium into. As you stated, box elder is another species that is a big concern, especially near more riparian areas where there's water. But this insect can hit over 100 different species with varying degrees of efficacy. Some trees it is going to kill pretty quickly. Others become uh, wells for the insect where the tree doesn't die and it's able to live for, for many years. Um, really quickly, we're getting some feedback online. Do you think you could speak more into the mic? Absolutely, yes. I will make sure to speak more into the mic. We'll get it right here. Yeah. Hopefully that's better. OK. All right. Like I said, we could talk about invasive shot hole borer all day, but we have another 10 pests to talk about. Um, so uh, pine pests, western pine beetle specifically. Um, these are uh, another beetle species that mine deep into the tree um, and are mining the phloem to disrupt, disrupt water and water and sap. Um, this is a beetle that can impact uh, multiple pine pine species. Uh, Monterey pine is one that is very susceptible to a lot of these kinds of insects. Um, and you're going to see a lot of dieback in the canopy with browning foliage uh, on uh, pine species that are are not deciduous. We're talking about evergreen species that you'll see dieback on. Um, uh, and this is one of multiple insects uh, that are infesting pines in our area, beetles like this. Um, these trees, these insects, both this one specifically and a lot of pine beetles will go after trees that are already in decline. Um, so when trees are diseased, when they're stressed, uh, these insects are drawn to it. So ethanol is a fermentation product of the sugars that are in resin and phloem. Um, and this product attracts beetles to dead, injured and dying trees. And so when we're talking about drought conditions that we haven't had for two years now in the Bay Area, but we had for many years prior, uh, these insects thrive in those conditions because you have trees that are already stressed. Um, and when a tree is already stressed, it becomes more susceptible to uh, these kinds of insects. So when we're talking about urban forest situations, I know I don't know San Francisco, what kind of watering program is present, but when there are drought conditions, uh, the best thing for these kinds of trees is to make sure their natural defenses are at their best. So that means watering and uh, making sure that conditions are optimal for them to be healthy. Uh, it's like supporting someone's immune system so they don't get sick. Uh, and these beetles, like I said, many of them are related, so treating to that, treating them is very similarly. Uh, you might have seen this pitch on Monterey pines uh, around here and throughout the Bay Area. This red frass, um, frass is uh, insect excrement. It is evidence that these trees are in the beetle. In, in these insects are in the tree. Um, so this is red turpentine beetle. Um, the adult beetle will pitch its tube uh, and frass below its entrance hole. Uh, and similarly, these are beetles that feed on phloem, will cause dieback, target the uh, target trees that are already in decline. Um, I see Monterey pine throughout the Bay Area, Bay Area that are impacted by this, this insect, um, especially in areas that are drought stricken. So once again, watering is crucial to make sure that these trees uh, are able to withstand the impacts of these insects when they show up. Um, and when it comes to treatment, some are available, but similarly to uh, invasive shot hole borer, it depends on our levels of infestation. Um, so if we have one or two pitch tubes on a tree, 
uh, that becomes a good candidate for a tree that can be treated similarly with trunk inject uh, soil injections to prevent uh, further infestation. Uh, however, if we have a tree that is already heavily infested, it's it's basically fatal. There is no way to reverse the damage to the tree's flow up that has already occurred. Um, so that's the big concern with this. California uh, five spined IPS beetle. Um, this one will have a red frass on the bark of the tree. Once again, you can see canopy dieback in the upper tree on a tree that should not be having this kind of dieback. Um, this insect and others that I've discussed too, uh, while they do cause damage to the phloem of the trees that uh, make it difficult for the tree to live, to move sugars throughout its, its trunk, there are also diseases associated with bark beetles that can cause further damage. So you have black stain root disease and blue stain fungi uh, that can infest the tree, that can, uh, these beetles can be a vector for. And these fungi, these diseases cause further damage to the trees. So even if we're able to control the beetle, now we have more than one thing we need to be trying to control in the tree. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind with these insects. We're not just looking to treat the insects, but also the diseases that they are vectoring. Mediterranean oak borer. So these galleries you'll see in this wood, uh, the gallery, this is very similar to the invasive shot hole border bore in the in uh, the way it looks. I'm sure you saw when we went and looked down in San Jose, you crack open a box elder, you could see these black galleries throughout the tree. So Mediterranean oak borer, I know is uh, my colleagues in Sacramento deal with this more often. It really likes hotter, drier climates, um, but it is present in our area as a whole in California. So it's something we want to keep an eye out for. Um, it does have smaller entrance holes, and like our other beetles here, depending on the level of incest infestation, we're, we are able to treat it. Um, but even when we treat the beetles, the fusarium that these insects are bringing into the tree is uh, more difficult to control, and the damage it does to the vascular system cannot be repaired. Uh, so it really depends on the level of infestation, if we are able to basically retain a viable tree. Obviously, this also depends on the location of the tree, risk it poses to surrounding areas, um, and things of that nature. Um, all of these beetles are closely related, and so the ways they're impacting our trees are similar, and also treatments for them are going to be similar as well. Moving on from beetles, um, we have two horned oak gall wasp. Now, this is a wasp species that impacts oaks throughout the area. Um, what it does is it lays its insects, its larva in uh, the leaves of oak trees. Uh, and it creates a gall. Uh, many times galls, in, there are thousands of kinds of galls in tree species. Uh, many of them are harmless uh, and don't cause problems to trees when they are in relatively moderate numbers. Uh, this species though will cause problems. It'll, call pre it'll cause premature leaf drop uh, on oak, oak leaves and it'll interfere with leaf photosynthesis. So you can see on the leaves in this photo, we have partial uh, necrosis of the leaves in the photo. It, uh, photos on the right, um, as well as decay of some photos on the left. So this is an insect that uh, also can be treated with uh, canopy sprays, I believe, um, to prevent the to prevent the wasps from being able to lay uh, their larva in the leaves uh, and cause cause this damage. Moving on to more oak damage, you have uh, oakworms, which uh, rather than laying their uh, larva in the leaves, these are, um, they're laying their larva on, on the leaves uh, and they are, um, chew they're chewers. So they're eating the foliage that are in the canopy. Um, and as you can see from the photo on the left, which is from Southern California, but this damage can happen up here, uh, it can severely defoliate our trees. And as, most people who work with trees know severe defoliation causes a host of problems. Uh, you know, lack of photosynthates, lack of um, uh, immune response to other diseases that come about. Um, so this is another insect that can cause damage uh, to the canopy of our tree. Uh, sudden oak death. This is one that has been talked about for a long time. Uh, I believed it showed up in California over 20 years ago. Um, no one is sure exactly where this disease came from, from the research that I've done. Um, but sudden oak death is caused by Phytophthora remorum. 
um, and is lethal. Now, there are treatments that exist to elicit the defense response from trees, but most often this disease is going to be lethal. Now, Phytophthora remorum has um, numerous host trees that it can uh, live on, uh, including things like Douglas fir, Coast Live Oak, but these are hosts that they're generally not going to be lethal with. Uh, and instead, these trees become a vector for this disease to spread via wind, moisture, um, water to two oak trees and tan oak trees where they are severely lethal. Um, this is a water loving fungi. So um, when you have, I've, I've seen this in urban situations where you have a tree that is growing in a planting strip, maybe there's a slope, maybe there's um, a divot and water is able to pool at the base of a tree, an oak tree, that becomes a prime breeding ground for Phytophthora. Um, this fungi gets into the vascular system of the tree, similar to our beetles, but this is a fungi. Um, and going after that vascular system and feeding on it becomes lethal for the tree. Um, oftentimes on coast live oaks, you'll see uh, in this photo right here, oozing cankers. Uh, this is an early sign of detection. I've seen this on many trees uh, in the East Bay. And uh, when you find this, this is a clear sign that um, Phytophthora may be present. And uh, as I stated before, there are treatment options that are available to try to elicit a response, but generally speaking, uh, it's considered lethal. Oh. oh, I had one beetle that escaped the beetle category. So now we have, an, we have another one to talk about. Um, so the Western Oak Bark Beetle, uh, WOBB, uh, it's been identified, I know my colleagues see it more often in the Sacramento area, but it is identified in other parts of the Bay Area. Um, the, similarly, this is an insect that will bore into the wood. You can see in the central lower picture, the black spots right there, which is a sign of the insect being in there, boring inside to feed on phloem. Um, the disease that it vectors uh, is very easy to spot. It's uh, a foaming bark canker. So you'll see on these trees, the top two photos, uh, that's actually foam oozing from the wood of the trees. Um, so it's very easy to spot this. Um, uh, however, while it's convenient that it's easy to spot, unfortunately, there is no uh, treatment right now for this. So the best control that is known at this time is removal, removal and trying to contain it to a specific area. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's really not much to do about foaming canker once it's present, unfortunately, at this time. I'm sure there are people smarter than me who are working on treatments for it. Um, yes, question. What are the, does it affect? Uh, it, yeah, yeah, it can, it, it, it can affect um, a number of oak species throughout the West. So coast live oaks, valley oaks, um, and others throughout the area. Um, oaks too. Yeah. So all your scarlet oak. Uh, Red oak. Yeah, it, it can it can affect a number of oak trees. Um, so there is is a, a broad range of, of oaks that can be targeted, unfortunately. Um, scorch disease. This can be confused for a lot of different things, but um, leaf leaf scorbat, leaf scorch twig dieback, and uh, branch dieback. They're caused by Xylella fastidosa. Um, you can see it on this olive tree on the right and the oak on the left. Um, in some cases, but most often uh, it can be confused for uh, other fungal diseases. There are a lot of lookalikes, including diplodia um, and botchospheria, bot canker. Um, so it's important when treating the scorch disease to get lab testing done. This disease can also be confused for abiotic conditions. So think drought conditions, depending on the species, think um, uh, salinity levels, cation exchange, things like that. Uh, can be confused for it. However, the disease can spread rapidly um, through a number of different tree species, uh, including elm, maple, sweet gums, and a number of oak trees. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for foliage that looks like this, where you have necrosis uh, from the tip backwards, uh, as well as twig dieback and branch dieback from the top down. Um, so yeah, we got a, we got a lot of pests we're talking about today. Can you say that? I'm sorry, treatments. Oh yeah, um, treatments for the scorch disease. So I need to get back specifically on scorch. I believe there's also a trunk injection or soil injection that can be done to provide resistance for this, but it's really important before uh, a treatment is um, applied for this that lab testing is done uh, because we don't want to be applying the wrong product for this disease. 
Um, Emerald ash borer. So now we're moving on to a couple pests that uh, are not readily identified in California yet, um, but there are people who are very concerned about them. So emerald ash borer is a pest that is of great concern on the East Coast and the Midwest. It has done extensive damage to the ash trees out there. Um, and you can see the trademarks of this pest. Uh, the photo on the bottom left is the zigzagging S-shaped galleries that uh, the insect larvae does as it works through the wood when it infests, as well as the D-shaped exit holes. Um, in these photos, you'll also see the adult emerald ash borer and the larvae of the insect. Um, these are also miners um, that are mining the phloem of trees. Uh, signs of them include bark cracking and yellowing of leaves as early signs of damage. Um, and as I stated, this insect, to my knowledge, has not been identified in California yet, uh, but is on the Oregon border. So uh, this insect is easily spread through firewood, uh, and it's Im important. We're going to talk about that one with our next pest as well. It's very important to burn it where you buy it. That's kind of the mantra with firewood, where we don't want to be moving firewood from county to county, let alone parts of the state or state to state, because these insect larvae can live in that wood uh, and escape into areas. So one to keep in mind. Um, another one is uh, the golden spotted oak borer. It is a cousin of the emerald ash blower, uh, emerald ash borer. <laughs> borer. Uh, it is a phloem feeder. Uh, it has a preference for red oak trees. Um, and a sign of this insect, as you'll see in the photo on the left, are weeping cankers that appear on the trunk uh, and canopy decline soon follows. Um, there are infestations uh, in Southern California. Um, and similarly, it is being spread. Sorry, yeah, I meant to specify. This one is in Southern California, but not Northern California at this time. Um, and it's believed to be moving around in Southern California very much through firewood. Uh, so once again, it's very important to burn it where you buy it, not move wood. Um, and if you have a buddy who just got a shipment of firewood from another county, have him burn it right away or send it back. Because when that wood sits, it gives the larva the opportunity um, to get out and uh, spread into the surrounding area. Um, it is identifiable uh, on the tree from these weeping, can weeping cankers. The insects though, where it gets its name, golden spotted orc borer, oak borer are uh, the golden spots that are on its body, as you can see in the photo on the top right. Okay, so those are the pests and diseases specifically that I talked about, that I'm planning to talk about today. If you wanna talk about any more after this specifically, we definitely can. Uh, but now we're going to move on to more of IPM strategies, things to keep in mind there, as well as uh, how treatment is going to work. Um, so when it comes to pests in our landscape, uh, insect and otherwise, seeing pests themselves are often difficult, as is the case with um, the invasive shot hole borer. These insects, their holes are the size of a, a pinhead. They're very small insects. I have one at home in a very tiny flask, uh, and they're very difficult to identify. So the thing that we're going to be able to see first before we see these insects are uh, the symptoms in trees, whether that be weeping cankers, whether that be canopy dieback. These are the things that we need to keep an eye out for to identify insect pests. Because if you're waiting for uh, an emerald ash borer to show up on a tree that you're standing in front of, you're going to be waiting a long time. Uh, it's going to be easier to identify the canopy dieback. Um, so some symptoms that... Uh, You'll see, though, this is a very limited list. There's many others you can see. Uh, are notches on the leaves in the canopy, uh, stunted leaves, holes in the trunks, as you saw in some of our photos with many of our beetles. That is a telltale sign that they are there. and can also let you know about the level of infestation. Um, tree response like sap flow, so is sap oozing out of wounds, um, and cankers. Um, I'll talk about later in this program, but we at West Coast Arborist use a program called Arbor Access to manage our large scale inventories for cities, county, counties, municipalities. Um, and what you're able, what we're able to do there is take close up photos of symptoms and trees and upload them into a database. And the benefit of that is that is now we're able to generate maps of where symptoms are showing up and it allows for targeted management. Um, but we'll talk about that further as we go on. Um, oh man, I thought I had changed the slide. Okay, so how to get assistance for pest problems. Um, make an Arbor Access list can often help with this. You can notify a West Coast Arborist account manager and PHC 
uh, those two guys listed there are for the Sacramento areas. I could have sworn I sent the updated version, but you can send an email to me, Leonardo Tickman. I am the PHC staff for the Bay Area, or Joe Bartolo. He is the West Coast account manager working with the city of San Francisco currently to help manage the urban forest here. So the two of us can help get PHC plans, treatments, monitoring implemented for the city of San Francisco. Um, it's uh, very important to properly identify uh, the trees that need to be inspected. Uh, images without an inventory identification make it difficult to work. Just sending me a picture of a tree in a city as big as San Francisco doesn't work. Um, an address without the species identification doesn't work. There can be a number of different species at a site. And uh, just an email forward from a client with a software link typically doesn't work either. We want photos with addresses with specific species. These are the things, these are the kinds of information we need to be able to identify trees in a large urban forest uh, that we need to inspect. And you guys on the ground are the ones that know the city best, know these tree best. Our staff is coming in to help you and uh, we just need the most information possible to identify these things quickly and manage them. So this is what a PCA recommendation will look like uh, when it comes to treating a pest problem. There are a number of different methods, products, um, risk levels that go along with that, PPE that is required. Um, so a recommendation is made after an inspection um, that prescribes the treatment materials and how specifically that will be applied. Um, as anyone who works in this field know, the labels for these products will often specify how you can apply them as well. Something that is used for a foliar spray will generally not be able to be used as a soil injection. And if it is, the label will specify that. Um, a proposal is then sent to a client like the city of San Francisco that describes the treatments as well as uh, costs that go along with that. And then a PHC technician will schedule that treatment. Um, I work with our PHC techs here in San Francisco. Occasionally, I will also come out and do it myself. I did some stump treatments over by Sutro Tower a couple weeks ago. So we're, we're here to be able to help you guys do these treatments. Um, we have the staff to do the recommendations, the treatments, the, the equipment, all of that to help with these kinds of things. So now we're going to talk about different kinds of uh, treatment or application techniques. Um, so there's trunk injection. Trunk injection actually uses equipment to um, penetrate through the bark of trees, get into the vascular system of the trees and directly apply product uh, into the tree. Um, this slide as I'm about to move on to it is actually an embedded video. Uh, so it shows one of our staff going through the process of trunk injection. So it gives you an idea of what it looks like to uh, apply a trunk injection. Um, and yeah, how the field work goes along with that. So with that being said, we tested this. I'm hoping it goes well uh, for everybody at home that you're able to hear this. If not, just let us know uh, and we'll try to get that corrected. system with a side pour. So I've already got chemistry in here. So we're ready to go. Our system's set up. I got a brand new 1564 <coughs> drill bit that I've already done a root flare inspection on. I will be injecting into the xylem area of the root flare, the lowest part. Um, and in the root flare here, this is where I'm going to get the thickest part of that xylem. And that's where I want to hit. So I've got a 20 inch DBH tree, so I'll do 10 injection sites. And, uh, and we'll go from there. So I'll get started on the injection sites now. As I get into this injection site, I don't want to rest my drill bit on there and go. I want to get it in there and I'm going to go in about a half an inch only. So you can see this fresh tissue nice and, and white right there. If it was dark brown, you would see you know, that would be a tall or sizable order that you've got some type of decay in there or something, but we don't have that. So I've got a nice fresh hole right there and I'm going to put that in. I see this is turned off already. That's what I want. And I'm going to bring this up to about 12 o'clock. Okay. I don't, and I've got to, I've got to kind of spread these out a little bit. I don't have a root flare all through here. So I'll go in here and I'll get into the lowest part of the crevice there. I don't want to start up high here on this uh, this bark mountain ridge. I want to get in tight there. So got fresh right there. You can see nice fresh tissue. I want to monitor where I injected and put that in there. 
always keep an eye on where you uh, you did your last injection. You don't want to get lost. I'll come over here. Another nice, good looking pigtail that came out. Put in there, go to about 12 o'clock. Now we can tell right here, there's something going on there. So I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to come over here a little bit so I can hopefully be guaranteed I get some fresh juice. And I did. Good. But again, you can we just didn't have that all the way cinched down. Got it. So while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and cinch that down. Now I know I've got a closed system. So you were watching it and it wasn't pressurized. It was just taking too long to okay. pressurize up. So right. I'm glad that happened, able to catch it on film so you guys can see those those types of things happen. So think about it when you're going through for this job setup. What is that there that you're? I guess it's a pressure relief valve. Okay. So the nice thing about this system is if you get too much pressure in here, this duct valve will just bleed off. It only takes so much. So now we're we're at 20, okay? So I always like to measure twice and cut once. So I'm gonna go back over and make sure all my T's are closed. I have nothing impeding in and around the area. So we're ready to go. So I'm going to open this up and you're going to see these lines populate. There we go. They're not all the way populated over here. I like to come to the back and open up this one first. As soon as I open this one, you're going to see it dump in. Um, yeah. There we go. And we're all open. You can see we're already just about out of the bottle within 10 seconds. Let me see air bubbles. My pressure is uh, staying steady. And I am already out of the bottle. So that was six mils per DSH. Per DBH, yeah. So we're look, talking 120 mils came up through the bottle in the lines. In about 10 seconds. Okay. Um, now we're just waiting for the rest of it to get through. I suspect it'll be two minutes in totality for 120 mils to get up in this tree. The rest of what you're seeing now is just remnants. If I stopped this whole system right now and took out what is in these lines, it's probably going to be about five mils. You really uh, want to let the what the tree work everything out of the Yeah, just let the natural, the trees natural vascular system work and run its course. So I'm at the end here. I grab one, circle it, grab the other. You can almost do it with your eyes closed because you're just kind of feeling down the line for that. The thing of this is, is if you take care of your equipment, your equipment's going to take care of you. If you right. don't, it's not going to take care of you. You're going to start asking for new parts. Get it like this. It sits like that. Grab your carabiner. Run that carabiner through and you're set we get to move very simple this is a singular injection site much like the q connect but we have a singular um, injection port as to multiple okay we can still achieve our goal but the nice thing is is that we're battery powered here there's no pressure that we manually have to put in and once we get this thing started you'll hear the fan start to operate that's based off of this computer board here operated by this battery. Nice thing about in here is there's nothing to break per se. I mean, the uh, the interface on here is computerized. It can it can break. Okay, we have tested this for well over 18 months and we haven't broken it. Okay, there's no check valve in here. Um, oftentimes when you have check valves and systems, they break frequently. Okay, you can see that I already have chemistry put in here. I already prepped this, so I put 400 mils in here. And I put 400 mils in here just for sake of this conversation. So if you're ready to go for the day, you can fill this thing all the way up one liter. Okay, I did put a liter in there. I don't need all that much for today. 
Um, but there's a prime mode in here. And once you get this, you'll see and we'll train you on it. You just hit the prime mode, put your T in there and get this all worked to the system. So when you get out of your truck for the day and you're hitting these trees out in the field, you're ready to go. You're not messing with anything. You drill your hole based off your species, DBH and rate you're going to use. Get it in there, hit the amount of mills. So on this 15 inch sycamore tree right here, okay, um, I'm going to do at a rate of six mils per DBH. So I'm going to go up in mills. I'm going to go 12 mils per injection site. That's because I have a 15 inch tree. Okay. And per each tree, I want to get those 12 mils in there per those seven injection sites that I'm going to use. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go over there. We'll uh, double check our work area, make sure there's no obstructions around the root flare and we'll get injected. The pigtails come out nice and fresh. Okay, I'm in there. I know I've got a 12 mil dose. And if you look at my interface right here, it has no counts. Okay, so I'm going to start this. I'm going to open it up. It changes colors on you, so you know that that's going. Okay, so it's dosing one. The PSI there is going between 10 and 11, 12. And it's using the tree zone vascular system to pull this up. I continue to inspect the injection site. I don't have any leaks. This should be just about done here. There we go, and we're done. Dose one done. Okay, this thing does it all for you by itself. Okay, I'm going to turn the T off. No leakage coming out, so we're set. Okay, so now I'm going to come over here. One, I'm going to come over here. Here's two. Again, yeah, this is the perfect one. Fresh grass, or not fresh grass, uh, fresh, good. Healthy live tissue. Go in there, open it up, and go. Here's I'm going to purge the rest of uh, the rest of this material that's in these lines back into here. So it's going to stop sucking from here into the tube. It's just going to take from here and dump it back in there. And that's a setting. Yeah. And this is this is just one of the parts that takes. A little longer. But at the end of the day, it's OK. It's safer. Yeah. You can see where it goes pretty quickly. So yeah, just take your time and then just purge it back in there. All right, so that just kind of goes over the technical aspects of trunk injection. Uh, it can be a little mystifying sometimes. It was for me when I first got onto it. So we wanted to share a little video demoing that. So thank you to the actors at Rainbow Ecoscience. Um, one of the big benefits of trunk injection compared to other techniques uh, is the fact that you're directly targeting the vascular system of the tree. Uh, in many areas, uh, you have to be very cautious about your application of products. So think uh, in public areas, one of those applications was in a park that was actively being used. Um, we're not spraying the canopy, so there's no drift uh, and we don't have. Yes, yeah, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, also think about riparian areas. So where there's water nearby, a soil injection is not going to work because product can potentially run off and get into the soil. Uh, with the trunk injection, we are directly putting the product into the vascular system of the tree uh, to prevent any sort of runoff like that into the surrounding ecosystem uh, or impacting people in the surrounding environment. So trunk injection, uh, as stated before, goes into the vascular system of the tree so that uh, the product moves up and into the trunk and canopy. Uh, it's important to choose injection, choose injection points at the base of the tree 
um, that are not in between the root foot. We want to hit our buttress roots um, because that's where there's going to be greater vascular tissue. Uh, you can see from the staining in the photos on the right where exactly these kind of uh, injections are going into before product is uh, moving its way up into the tree. Um, trunk sprays. So a trunk spray, similar to a canopy spray, is when a product is sprayed directly onto the trunk of the tree or lower scaffold limbs. Um, it is uh, the product is then soaked directly into the vascular system uh, through the tree bark and is taken upwards. Uh, generally, this is most effective with thin barked trees. You're going to have a lot of difficulty using this kind of application on something like a redwood, where there's very thick bark. Um, so these sprays will deposit the insecticide onto the trunk uh, and can also protect the outside of the trunk from bark boring insects, like five of which we covered earlier in our presentation. Um, it's very important to thoroughly apply the chemicals uh, down from the root flare up to our lower scaffold limbs. Uh, and while product can be sprayed, it can also be painted onto the trees. Uh, as you can see in the photo on the left, now uh, there are pros and cons to both of these techniques. Uh, the pros with trunk spray is that it is a lot more effective when it comes to labor being used. It's a lot quicker um, to cover multiple trees very quickly. However, uh, the benefits of painting on the left is that there is way less drift. There's no drift really, uh, and it can be used in very close proximity to people uh, and parks and other uh, high priority areas. You can see in the photo on the left, uh, the reason why they need to paint is because they are right next to homeowners. And so trying to spray like this right next to homeowners is not generally going to go well with the HOA. So it's very important uh, to, when doing trunk applications like this, trunk sprays, figuring out uh, what is the most appropriate technique. Yes, we want to save uh, on labor very often, which is why trunk spray can be preferable. But in many cases, particularly in the urban landscape, uh, painting is the preferable option because it's what community uh, is going to prefer. Uh, soil injection. So there are a ton of products that are injected directly into the soil of a tree um, that are then taken up by the root system of the tree itself. And by taking it up, it does similarly to what's happening with a, uh, a trunk injection. Injections are done uh, in a grid pattern from the trunk out to the drip line of the tree where possible. However, oftentimes in our urban landscape, we're not able to go out to the drip line of the tree because there's hardscapes there, um, in which case uh, injection plans can be adjusted by PHC tax. Um, the soil must be most moist for these chemicals to be taken up properly, um, and water and st water stress and heat will interfere with this uptake. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide. Yes, so these products um, like water, like nutrients, uh, are being ta being taken up by the tree's vascular system uh, through transpiration. So for anybody who has you know some background in plant biology generally, um, water and minerals move up through the xylem uh, via transpiration, the water pressure uh, differential between the soil, the plant, and the atmosphere to move through here. So it's very important that we have moist soil when these injections are going into the ground, because if there's no water in the soil, there's not going to be any transpiration. There's nothing to move this product up into the tree. Um, also, transpiration generally can be impacted by a number, a number of environmental factors um, that can then limit the uptake of chemicals. Um, so whether the treatment is a trunk injection, a trunk spray, or a soil injection, the same process uh, is at work by the tree to move these chemicals uh, into uh, the xylem, the phloem, all the way out into the leaves uh, where it can control insects and other pests. Um, water moving up from the roots through the limbs and out to the leaves carries the chemicals with it, uh, and we control where the chemicals end up by choosing the correct chemical for where the insect is, uh, and one of the three methods, trunk sprays, soil injection, trunk injection. So, um, the key to effective insect control is to apply them uh, when water flow is at the highest in the tree. Uh, this is generally from the spring to the fall, um, depending on where you are and uh, the rain levels of your area. Um, we ob obviously we get a lot of storms from November to, I mean, today. Uh, so it's when rain events like this are happening that so soil moisture is high uh, and these treatments become effective. 
Um, insect pressures will increase through September, um, but our ability to move insecticides in the trees will diminish as the summer heat increases. Um, so below are uh, five factors that can affect transpiration rates. Um, so wind, which as it increases, increases transpiration. Humidity, which as it increases, will decrease transpiration um, because of that pressure differential in the water in the plant versus the air. Um, our light intensity, more light means more transpiration. Um, temperature, things are hotter. Uh, water is, is moving more quickly through the soil in the plant. Uh, and water supply, when there's less water, there's less transpiration. Um, and this is both due to the environmental factors described above, but also the plant's reaction to a lack of water. The closing of stomata, uh, the limiting of that transpiration has uh, knock-on effects of limiting the plant's ability to properly take up uh, the chemicals that we are trying to treat it with. So the conditions that the trees are growing in are very important for uh, an application to be effective. Um, yeah. Gen most products will generally need to be applied annually. And, and we like, like we have a lot of well, we have several like endangered insect species here in, in San Francisco, yeah. including our butterflies and that sort of thing. So how impactful is it to those local insects? Yeah. So generally, with these products, they're not broad spectrum, so they're very targeted to the insects they're going off after. Um, and that also has to do with the fact that a lot of these insects, um, not all of them, but many of them are ho host specific. Um, so we're going after the hosts that are most likely to be impacted by these trees. Um, so keeping that as mine is important to developing an important IPM and making sure that the things that we are applying are not having uh, negative effects to pests or not pests to beneficial insects like these butterflies. Um, so yes, a lot of these products are specific to their hosts um, or to their targets, but there's some that aren't. So it's important to keep in mind beneficial insects that are in the area, how closely are they related to the insects that we are targeting, um, and keeping that in mind can make sure that the products that we're applying are not having negative effects. Um, one thing that I know is happening right now is a lot of neonicotoid neonics are being phased out because those have a lot of knock-on effects um, with bees. So um, DPR also uh, puts a lot of thought into what products that they allow to be used, both in the urban landscape, but also in the landscape ag as a whole. Yes. Hey, uh, thanks for the the soil applied stuff. It's usually a neonicotinoid like dinotefrin or imidacloprid. Yeah. And those have that like, uptake through the roots, but they also are broad spectrum yeah. insecticides and, and kill all kinds of insects. Uh, dinotefrin gets absorbed quickly, but, but doesn't last long in the soil. Uh, then imidacloprids, you know, banned in Nassau County in New York because of high water table, but uh, that's that's got much longer lasting uh, effects in in the soil, maybe 10, 11 months, something like that. But it's not as potent to a lot of things. So you have those those trade offs. Neither of those we could use in San Francisco for you know with our regulatory environment. But then when it comes to like trunk sprays, like a permethrin or something like that, can get absorbed uh into the bark or at least just sit on the outside of the bark so that the insects are feeding on that and are controlled as they're like moving into the tree so i i love that aspect of it but if if a mosquito lands on it that's also going to be absorbing the the um the permethrin or whatever other <laughs> insects so i i think that like we have a long way to go with targeting uh like the pest specific products, but uh, I think the trunk injections, things like that can can help avoid the the impacts to things that are just flying around. And certainly we're so much better off than just the hosing. Just hits the pollinators. Yeah, well, the pollinators, yeah. But the uh, we're so much better off than like dousing trees with seven in the 70s or something like that. We've come a long way, but I think there's still a lot of concern as we like learn more about those effects. Yeah, absolutely. And as you, uh, and this is coming from somebody who spent entire summers injecting trees. So I'm very familiar with it and have definitely thought a lot about the impacts and the trade-offs. Yeah. And as, as you, uh, brought up with San Francisco's regulatory environment, DPR in California is, um, phasing out some of these products that have these, uh, broad spectrum impact on beneficial insects. And it's important to keep in mind, uh, the, the benefits and costs that come along with these. Uh, doing that calculation is an important part of uh, an IPM strategy. 
Um, and it's important to keep that in mind before these chemicals are applied into the landscape. Thank you. Um, so August and September uh, are uh, when the heat is going to be the most intense generally throughout the state. I know in San Francisco we can have a different climate. Um, and uh, evidence of transpiration slowing down can be seen in uh, leaf scorch on the margins. Um, and so pest controls need to be apl applied before this so that they are effective. Right now, I know we are doing a ton of applications um, because there's so much moisture in the soil because pests are emerging now. Um, so complaints will be coming in late summer when treatments don't work. Um, that's why these treatments need to be avoided in the hottest parts of the year. Uh, August and September is up there because generally through much of the state that is the case. Um, but I know from living in the Bay Area, oftentimes October can be the hot, hottest month in September. Um, so it's important to keep your local environment in mind uh, when doing these kinds of treatments. Um, so when it comes to regulations for these things, uh, the ANSI A300 uh, Part 10 IPM uh, is a very important tool uh, to, to uh, guide monitoring practices, ID for pests, uh, and uh, treatment. Treatments can take many forms. Uh, including chemical applications, but also cultural techniques. Um, and post-treatment monitoring uh, is essential, is an essential part of an IPM strategy uh, to ensure a positive result. If monitoring isn't taking place after a treatment has taken place, uh, it's not a complete integrated pest management strategy. Uh, monitoring is the linchpin both beforehand, after, and after treatment takes place uh, to uh, make sure that a pest has been properly identified, treated properly, and that it's been effective. Um, because if not, we need to go back and look at, okay, why was it not effective? Was it a product issue? Was it an environmental issue? Um, and uh, yes, keeping all of that in mind, IPM objectives include IDing our pests and pl plants, uh, monitoring protocols, establishing the threshold levels where treatment needs to take place, uh, treatment options, um, your environmental and site conditions, cultural needs and conditions, uh, the soil conditions, and making sure uh, the equipment being used is in good condition. Because as our friend from Rainbow Ecoscience said, uh, equipment that's cared for will take care of you. Um, I'm not sure if the city of San Francisco has any PHC techs at the moment, um, but yes, it's important to keep that uh, maintenance of your equipment in mind. Um, ISA also has uh, best management practices for IPM. Um, and as I stated before, the cornerstone of IPM is monitoring. I jumped the slide a little bit. Um, an early intervention is critical to keeping the population low and the damage to an urban forest uh, minimal. That's why when it comes to invasive shot hole borer, we're trying to stay on top of it so that if it does show up here, uh, there's monitoring in place that can identify it and early intervention that can take place to address it. Um, monitoring frequency shall be established. It's not a should, it's a shall. Um, so the monitoring must be a part of the management strategy when it comes to pests in the in urban environment. Um, and soil management, there's a ton of things to keep in mind when it comes to managing trees generally and strengthening them, uh, their immune system, for a lack of a better word, uh, to have uh, defense against pests and insects. Um, but the one that me and my colleagues believe is maybe the most important is managing our soils, because that is the root, where the root system of the tree lives. That's where many pests live. That's where our water and our nutrients come from. So it's important to properly assess our soils. Um, manage the soil organic matter content. Soil organic matter content is important, but we don't want too much of it in many cases. Um, mitigating compaction, which I know is a huge issue uh, in urban environments where uh, compaction happens with our hardscapes, oftentimes is necessary with certain engineering requirements. You need to have compaction, um, but this can have a, a major pro cause a major problem for our tree root systems. Um, we want to reduce plant competition so that trees are not competing for uh, water and nutrients from uh, other smaller herbaceous plants that maybe have very fine quick root systems that can take these things up. Um, we want to moderate and monitor temperature, uh, improving our soil structure, whether that be with uh, amendments or air spading, things like that. Um, managing our soil moisture content, tracking that with tensiometers where appropriate. Um, managing our soil biology, which also comes from testing. Um, there's also mycorrhizal injections that in some cases can be effective, but are not always recommended. There's a lot of science still going on with that. 
um, reducing our soil erosion, and uh, knowing when to fertilize, what to fertilize with, and do I need to analyze my soil first before I apply fertilizer application? Uh, fertilizer is not the end all be all solution for tree health problems. Um, okay, so that covers, um, what do I have left? I have about like 20 minutes basically. So 15, 20. 15, 20. So I'm gonna start talking a little bit about um, West Coast Arborist's software uh, that we use to manage urban forest on a macro level. We're probably not gonna get through the whole thing, um, but we will get started on it and basically talk about the importance of having large scale tree inventories to manage trees in the urban forest, both when it comes to pruning methods, um, but also for plant health care because pests are not infesting one street or one neighborhood. They don't care about city boundaries. Uh, they are moving where it makes the most sense for them. Um, so what are some of the management tasks that can be better managed using a large scale tree inventory? Um, so the five we're going to talk about today is customer service with residences, um, building uh, lists. So this is building targeted trees, um, risk management, being able to track activities such as product application uh, and managing a budget because obviously we're all here trying to manage trees in the urban forest within limited resources. Um, so customer service, um, plant health care keep uh, having a uh, software like this allows for plant health care treatments, uh, their cycles to be tracked. It allows to verify uh, where the last time, when the last time a tree was treated so that we know we're not applying too, too many treatments. Uh, and it gives us a system to know which residents do we need to inform that treatment is coming to your neighborhood. Because a lot of residents don't like when a PHC truck just shows up out of the blue uh, and starts applying chemicals that they are not aware of. Um, on the flip side, this system also allows for um, service requests. Yes, for pruning, which is included there, but also for plant health care treatment. So it allows the city staff that we work with to take in requests from residents as well as uh, things that they, they identify in their neighborhood uh, and communicate that to West Coast Arborists uh, digitally saying, um, these are the trees that we have identified that need treatment. Um, it allows you to verify your needs uh, and add to the list. Was there something you were having difficulty seeing? Uh, oh, that's Anaheim. Yeah, so that's where West Coast Arbors is based, Anaheim. Figured that would be uh, the test city to put up, not test city, but the sample city to put up here. Uh, West Coast Arborist, we work with basically one and two municipalities throughout the state uh, to manage their trees, but not everyone has this mapping software implemented to collect up this data. It's a lot of data, especially for a tree, for a city as large as San Francisco. And I have that word stuck in my head for weeks. Um, so in addition to plant health care, having a database like this allows for keeping track of planting services, where trees need to be planted, when they've been planted, selecting the appropriate species to have a diversified plant palette in your urban forestry, as well as keeping track of watering needs, because we know that when we plant new trees, we want to have uh, watering is very crucial to good establishment. Um, when trees need to be removed, when we have trees uh, that maybe have become overrun with ISHB or another pest that need to come out, being able to target that, um, as well as emergency services. As we know from the storms last year, we had tons of tree emergencies that needed to be addressed quickly. I'm pretty sure our crews were out here a lot dealing with those. Um, and being able to reference work history. This is really important when it comes to plant health care because we want to know how many times we've applied a product to the tree, not just so that we don't over apply, so that if there is a plant health care issue that is persisting, we can see what have we done in the past? Has this worked or not? Do we need to pivot to change to something else? Um, and this also allows for uh, a, data, a, a data recording system uh, that can be used to provide data to government agencies such as DPR when they want to know how much product is being applied in an area because there is a lot of tracking that needs to come when it uh, needs to happen when it comes to these products. Um, so these are samples of just lists of uh, requests that have come in from city staff uh, basically asking management uh, for help. It allows also to track residents calls. So that's what this is specifically is uh, residences that have called an issue. So yes, city staff is crucial to managing these pests that are coming to your area, but your residents are also the kind of people that can helping you can be helping you out with this. Um, so educating residences and community members on what these pests look like, what the signs of them look like, then give uh, them the ability to communicate that to city staff. 
um, because that gives you a lot more eyes. And then that can be that information can then be passed on to uh, either the appropriate agency or a company like West Coast Arborist that can then come up with a management plan. As we stated before, identifying these things early and monitoring them are crucial to addressing them quickly. Um, so that's why having something that incorporates the community in uh, is very beneficial. There's only so many of us at the company. There's only so many of you in the staff. But there are hundreds of thousands of people in the city that can potentially be eyes to identify these pests in your communities. Um, so in our software, what we're able to do when we have a large scale uh, inventory of trees is create what we call a list, a group of trees that can then be managed. Um, this allows for cyclical planning, knowing how many trees every year we need to treat, um, deline delineating areas into zones or districts that allow for uh, moving treatment throughout different areas, um, and of course, economies of scale. When we identify a ton of trees in the area uh, that need to be treated, this allows us to forecast, predict, and in many cases, lower the costs associated with treatment. Um, so having these big management plans is very beneficial uh, to uh, doing large-scale plant health care treatments. Um, also, service requests, as I stated previously, these are generally driven by residences um, and are constrained by budget and ordinances as those can dictate the response. Um, but it allows us to generate these lists so that we know what is coming in, what is the organizational threshold for the city when it comes to those requests before something needs to be implemented. This allows that information from the community to be fed to the cities and a company like West Coast Arborist. Um, and as I stated before, a treatment list, it allows our staff, our PHC people to organize uh, their days, their weeks, their months when it comes to treatments, um, organizing our guidelines uh, and our field staff, um, as well as species monitoring programs. It's a lot easier to go out and monitor a ton of trees when you're able to generate uh, a map that is an overlay of the city of San Francisco that only shows maybe your box elder or your platanus or your Monterey pine or only trees that have been identified as affected. Um, having an interactive map like this allows you to move through the inner urban landscape much quicker to identify these things. Um, planting lists, once again, that's another thing that can be used for this kind of, used with this kind of software. Um, uh, risk management, so this isn't uh, as directly tied to IPM, but is a, an important benefit of having a software like this. Um, it gives us uh, an accurate work history, so we're able to show whether there's a claim, whether there is a public inquiry about treatment for these diseases. Uh, it allows us to uh, provide that information to different entities and allows us to defeat and mitigate claims that may come towards the city for a lack of response for something like this. Um, having lists like this also show proactive planning. It shows that not only do we have many years of past treatment that we're dealing with, here's our plan for the next three years and five years implemented in this mapping software. Um, and as I stated before, this is a record keeping software. It allows us to keep photos and notes of trees that have been identified and need treatment. Um, also sidewalk issues. This is uh, something that can work for IPM as well, but root root issues are just something that we're generally dealing with in the city all the time. I'm sure Public Works gets a lot of complaints about that. Um, so there's options to identify trees uh, that have sidewalk issues or are causing sidewalk issues in your community, uh, and as well as being able to make notation of construction activities that are happening near your trees. Because uh, oftentimes construction activity near trees can have negative impacts on tree root systems, negative impacts on root systems, impact tree health, Tree health that is weakened can lead to pest infestation. All of these things are connected. Uh, this is just a sample of what it looks like to have dis, uh, trees that need removal based on diseased or declining, whether that be a pest infestation, uh, poor structure, stumps that are present, which as we stated before, many pests can infest, uh, and being able to prioritize that with a specific budget. Um, and yes, as I stated before, having uh, data inventories like this allow us to uh, track our activities, work that is both performed by West Coast Arbor staff and City of San Francisco staff can be recorded in the software. It's not just our people that are going out there doing it, recording it. It can also be public crews, uh, tree trimming and application work that can be recorded in this software. Um, and this allows us to just keep accurate data. It's, we don't want to just have our data in there. We want to have the data that is being used 
the the work that is being done on on trees, no matter who it is included in this, whether it's us, another contractor, or the city. Um, it also allows us to keep track of the status of the work that is being performed by us or another agency and monitor it. Uh, this software allows you to see in live time where a crew is in your neighborhood, what street uh, is having pruning performed on, where is the PHC crew doing, crew doing applications on a specific day. And managing a budget. Uh, as city staff and any agency will know, we're all working within specific uh, monetary restrictions. So being able to forecast the plant health care treatment needs and pruning cycles uh, on grids and zones uh, allows us to both budget based on our present means, but also incorporate needs into the budget for future years. Um, having service requests come in from residents gives us an idea over many years how many emergencies and things like that are going to get called in and that can also be integrated into budgets um, as well as removal plans and planting plans that can be developed over multiple years to budget for a city um, this is just a sample of what a budget looks like from over 10 years ago now but uh, how costs can be spread out over four years so that things uh, such as removals that are uh, of high priority are addressed first. Uh, and pruning can be spread out evenly, trees that need to get planted, plant health care equipment or treatments, all of that can be applied uh, and budgeted for over multiple years, which is essential to uh, an effective management plan. Uh, and this is just what it looks like in our system to have uh, job numbers that are outstanding, showing you how much of a budget you still have. So let's say you've allocated $300,000 uh, to do soil injections for a specific issue. This allows you to see, okay, how much have I used in my budget? How much do I have left for treatment? Based on how much I do I have left, where do I want to apply these resources in my city? Um, so this is how the uh, budget managing aspect of the software is beneficial. And then just uh, in general, this is the five things we discussed here when it comes to management plans, the benefit of customer service, how you're able to interact with your residents, uh, being able to build a list for accurate plant health care treatment, uh, risk management, being able to record your work history, your application history, uh, and defend from claims, uh, tracking uh, work activities for the sake of it to know that things are being done effectively and not overdone. Um, and of course, managing your budget, a very important aspect of urban forestry and really any public uh, agency management. That's everything. Um, if there's any questions, I am happy to answer them now. I know we covered a lot of different things, um, but yeah, it looks like we did pretty good on time too. Indeed. Yeah. Well, give you a round.